Multi Centre of Excellence monthly event that we hold. There's uh, quite a few new people that are supposed to be coming here this evening, so just before we begin, we'll have a show of hands. Who's actually been to one of these events before? I know I recognise a few new people. Okay. And who's completely new to this event? Okay, so we've got a few of you. Right then, so what we actually do is we're going to do a, a live demonstration of an NLP tech tech week this evening. Then we're going to have a practice with other students. And we have a fantastic guest speaker who's here with us. He's come all the way down from London. He's going to be talking you through how to turn your worst days into your best days. So before we begin, I will let Jimmy do a bit of an introduction. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we'll make a start. Yes. We'll just make a start. We're waiting for a few people to arrive. I'll arrive as and when they come through. Oh, I'm hearing music. <laughs> I was hearing things then. A little worry when you start hearing things. Okay, so this evening what we're going to do before Harry comes on is fantastic of him to come down. It's going to be an awesome evening. I'm going to take it through an NLP process as we do on a monthly basis. And the one we're going to look at this evening is visualization and rehearsal. This is something that's very really, uh, close to me because it's a process I use in a lot of areas, in business and sport, and helping people uh, on a medical level. I don't profess to be a medical expert, by the way, but I do see some phenomenal results. So you can take away from this what you will, which is key. Has anyone ever done mental rehearsal visualization before? Okay, so we've got a few sharp hands. For those of you who haven't put your hand up, you've all done it before, we all do it. We all visualize. Okay, think of the color of your front door or your car. We all visualize on one level or the other. The key is, and what we're gonna do this evening, is put you in the driving seat. So you visualize the way you want things to go, which is key. Okay, it's a process that is used in sport to fine tune athletic performance, and it can be transferred across to business, and also it can be transferred across to the area of people who may be in some, on some level debilitated by maybe depression, anxiety, or uh, variable other illnesses and ailments. Okay. Okay, so we begin by the power of visualization. How powerful is visualization? Just think of this room that we're in now. At one point, this will have been in someone's mind. Think of the phone that you use. Think of the sat nav that you use, the car that you drive, the airplanes that you fly. At one point, they will have been something in something in someone's mind. And that's how powerful visualization is. Yet, in the world that we live in today, we probably don't visualize and use the creative part of the mind as much as we should do for one reason or the other. But I'm not going to go into that because the seminar is not about that. The seminar is about how to actually program your sat nav. You don't need to know how the mind works. The analogy I, I use is the mind is like a sat nav. You don't need to know how a sat nav works, the program is like A to B. You just need to know how to put the actual program in. You don't need to know how it works. Like a phone, you don't need to know how a phone works, you just need to put the digits in there to make the call. And that's the key where this seminar is concerned. All top class athletes, entrepreneurs, inventors, think of Michelangelo and some of his paintings all those years ago, at one point they'll have visualized a process in their mind. Okay, before we move forward, what I want to do is a couple of exercises. A quote by Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is power. Okay, it wasn't knowledge that, well, at a point it wasn't knowledge that invented the aeroplane or the mobile phone or all the wonderful gadgets we use these days. It will have been someone's imagination. Some will have thought, well, what if we can do that? And what if we can do this and the other? Which is key. Who runs your mind? Who would you say runs your mind? Who runs it? Think about it. Think about the question momentarily. Who runs your mind? Think about the things that we use, modern technology. You go home, you watch TV, you're bombarded by all these images, sounds, you're in the car, you listen to the radio, 
They talk about smell, taste, sights. You walk around and you see logos, you see colors. So who runs your mind? Our mind is a very powerful tool that we can use to get from where we are to where we want to be. Okay, and our mind is impacted by various situations, good and bad. Now, this seminar is an insight to take control back of, back of our mind. Now, think about this scenario, for example. Okay, because one of the areas we're going to look at in the seminar, how we can vis use visualization for variable medical conditions to make an impact. Think about it. You go to, and this has happened to a number of my clients, by the way, this has happened to my clients. You go to your GP or your trusted consultant. You have an ailment, you have an ache, you have a pain, whatever it is, you're not feeling so great, and they tell you, that's it. That's just the way it's going to be. You go and tell me you feel down, that's it. I've got this prescription for you, take that, have a milligrams a day, and just cry yourself to sleep, get up, and carry on. What do you think goes through someone's mind when that happens? What, what do you think would go through someone's mind? If you go in there and, and they're basically resigned to the way you are, what, <coughs> what do you think? Optimism or how would you feel? <laughs> how do you think someone might feel? Anybody? Negative, upset. Definitely. Oh. Sorry, negative, upset. And low. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So sometimes I get clients come on to me. As I said, I don't profess to be a medical expert. It's not my field. My field is physiology, NLP, hypnotherapy, psychology, CBT. Yet, in saying that, I know enough about the mind and the way the body works to realize that the mind is a powerful tool. And how we channel that tool is instrumental in terms of how we think and how we feel. So, if someone is feeling that way, down and everything else that goes with it, Imagine the images that go through their mind. And imagine you hold someone in high esteem. Some people see the local GP or consultant as near enough God. Whatever they say is gospel. No, you said that's wrong with me, that's it. You've given me that label and I'm going to conform to that label. Which is another story and dangerous in itself. Now, I want you to do this exercise. Okay. I want you to think of a negative experience, if you can, please. Just think of a negative experience, nothing too traumatic. Just close your eyes and think of a negative experience. Okay, nothing too majorly traumatic. But think of a negative experience and notice what comes to mind. What you see, what you hear, and what you feel. The colors, the sights, the sounds. How it makes you feel, your heart rate, your breathing. What happens when you think of that negative experience? and just gradually come back to the here and now in your own time, own pace. What was it like to reflect on that negative experience? How did it feel? Any thoughts? Any thoughts on what it was like to go into that negative experience? Feel yourself withdrawn. Withdrawn, yeah. Could you imagine running your mind that way on a daily basis? Could you imagine getting up in the morning from the moment you wake up? That's exactly what goes through your mind a high percentage of the time. Could you imagine that? And that's what happens to some people in certain situations. And I'm sure you all come across some people. And maybe you've been in that situation yourself. Because I know I have. Very early on in my life, when I was told I had to give up sport, and I trained for years, doing sport, and they told me I had to give up because of asthma. I know I felt like that. Yet, I went away. I had a bit of a sulk. But I picked myself back up again. I thought, I'm going to use my skills and my determination in my late teens to fight back. I'm not going to give up that easy. Just because the doctor says to me, it's probably best you give up. I wasn't going to take it. So I embarked on my career and I travelled Europe, I based myself in the UK, I'm still based here now. I went to the States and I achieved 
as much as I possibly could in my athletic career until injury hit me again. And the same scenario again, it was the same thing again, that's it. And, I, and, and it was at that point I realized that these people don't have all the world's answers. They're not God. This is anybody else just like me and you, it's just an opinion. Okay, there's nothing factual about anything. Science is just opinion. So really, if we take control of our mind, who knows what's possible? And I've transferred those skills over my lifetime as a coach to help people get the best out of themselves. Now, we look at the other scenario, think of the positive experience. Okay, so if you just close your eyes really relax and think of a positive experience, and notice where you are, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, and what it's like to reflect on that positive experience. Just notice your physiology, your heart rate, your breathing, what it's like to reflect on that positive experience. But it feels better than the last time, the last experience. You can gradually come back if you want to. If you don't want to come back, you can stay. They'll wake you up at 10 o'clock tonight and you can come back there. Okay, what was it like to go into that positive experience? It's very opening and freeing. Of course, <laughs> certainly, definitely. And I certainly don't live in an airy fairy world here. I'm not one for airy fairy positive thoughts, and that's the end of that. Because it doesn't work that way. I'm not daft enough to, re to, to think that the world outside is perfect. It's far from perfect. Okay. I don't look outside and think, great, what a wonderful world. Albeit, there are a lot of positives. Yeah, there are challenges. And the key is, when someone comes along to me and they have a problem, it's not just about smothering over the cracks. It's about recognizing the problem and looking for a solution. We look for a solution. The ratio I use, personally, is I look for 90%, nine times. I look for nine solutions for every problem. And we look over every solution to the problem and start looking at a way forward. And I might not understand a great deal about your condition, yet in saying that, if we can have a more positive outlook and take things one step at a time, who knows where the road will take us. And I've seen some amazing situations and some amazing things. And I certainly wouldn't tell anyone not to take their medicine or not to or, or, or take any, any other advice outside my remit. But I've seen some reckless things. I remember a while ago I had a guy come and see me, it was for his son, and his son had asthma. So I guess I could sort of relate to that. He was very young. His self-esteem was very low because he was very, very young and he was suffering at school. So I could relate to what it was like. When you go to school, you've got your asthma spray, you've got to take it three times a day, and everybody's watching you, and you think, why can't I just be like everybody else? Why do I need to take this spray three or four times a day? And you feel self-conscious and you lose your self-esteem. And he says to me, his dad says, can you help him? I said, well, how do you want me to help him? What can I do? He goes, can you do some confidence building with him? I said, sure, we can give it a go. So we did some sessions that incorporated NLP and some work on the field as well, some sports work. And ironically, after a few weeks, what was really interesting, he came for confidence. And his dad said to me by the end of the sixth session, this was a sixth course session, he goes, he hasn't been taking his asthma spray. That's not come from me, because like I said, I wouldn't advocate anyone not take any medicine or whatever, but he hadn't been taking them. I said, well, what's, what prompted that? He's built his confidence. The only time he has taken it is for absolute necessity. And that has had a massive knock on effect for his confidence. He gets up in the morning, he's got a spring in his step, and he goes to school feeling a lot more positive. So we did the process that we're going to sort of look at tonight. And obviously in six sessions we do a lot more than we'll cover tonight, but we're going to look at some key points that we did during that process to help him move forward. But he wasn't the only one. And over a period of a long time, I helped work with many, many people using tools like visualization has a massive impact. Okay, now you look at TV and you see these famous people and you think, great, they must be privileged or lucky, must have gone to a good school, good parents, 
good family, good support network to achieve what they have achieved. Perfectly fit and everything else that goes with it. But we never sort of think possibly they might come from difficult situations. Now, there was a study in a university in America, in Chicago, and they took three groups of people in basketball. Three groups. They took one group that practiced physiologically every day, getting the ball in the net. They took another group that visualized, and it's a group that didn't do nothing at all. The group, after six weeks, that had the highest return of hitting the net, or getting a ball in the net, was a group that visualized. Because the mind can't tell the difference between a real and a not real experience. So if we're going to practice technique, or process, the mind is the best place to start, which is key. Let's reflect on certain people. Anyone ever heard of Sir Steve Redgrave? Who knew that he had diabetes? Diabetic. Do the research, get on the internet, Google it. Diabetic. Five gold medals, he won. Pretty good return. Okay. Jim Carrey. Depression. As a young person, he had depression. Who would have thought that? Kareem has been very successful as an actor. Beethoven, the disappointments he went through, couldn't hear, yet managed to write amazing symphonies. Depression as well. Roosevelt, as well, he had paralysis, became seriously ill. A lot of people didn't realize that when he was giving his speeches later on in his career as the American president. He battled his way through. Tiger Woods, as a youngster, had a serious stutter. And he practiced and practiced and practiced and overcame that stutter. No one would know now. Agatha Christie, as well. Millions of people around the world have read her books. Supposedly dyslexic as a child. Didn't stop her from becoming a bestseller. Bradford McIntyre. Has anyone ever heard of Bradford McIntyre? No? No one ever heard of Bradford McIntyre? Well, you can read the transcript if you get a chance to on the internet, and it'll tell you a little bit about this guy. This is a guy who goes into his doctor and he's told he's got six months to live. Could you imagine that? You go in to see a consultant and you've got six months. Imagine your world and how you'd feel and what you'd think. Could you imagine the impact that would have on someone's life? You go in there and he talks about how he felt, the adrenaline, his teeth chattering, feeling like throwing up and not knowing what to do, crying inconsolably. Was he really going to die? Six months came and went, he says. Then 18, then a couple of years, and then 16 years later, still alive, still going. So there you go. The medics aren't always right. The professionals aren't always right. And what's interesting is that he talks about Amongst all the treatments he had, he talks about visualization and imagery being a key part in the process to keep him going. The power of visualization and imagery. Who would have thought that? Someone who's medically qualified tells someone, you got six months and 16 years later, they're still going. They're still alive. The mind and illness. If you get a chance to, I'm not going to go into great depths this evening because this is going forever, but it's been proven scientifically and it's been reported on newspapers that a patient's outlook can have a massive impact on their well-being if they've been diagnosed 
with an illness. And their chances of recovery can be greatly affected just by the mind. I'm sure you've come across people who've been diagnosed with a variety of illnesses and you either see them kick on or they degenerate. Degeneration happens sometimes in the mind. And that's not to say that obviously, I said earlier, I'm not professing to be medically qualified and obviously there are certain illnesses that have certain impacts. Yet in saying that, having a positive outlook and taking it day by day can't do you any harm really. <coughs> and when I was working with someone or doing some work with someone a few weeks ago and they wanted to do a little bit of work just so they could have, in their own words, some sort of life back. <coughs> they were in a situation where they talked about being terminal. Now, as I said before, I don't profess to have all the world's answers. Yet, in saying that, it's undeniably a horrible situation to be in. I wouldn't want that on anyone. Yet, in saying that, what do we do? Do we go out there and take every day as it comes, give it our best shot? Or do we just put our head under the covers and resign ourselves? Well, you could argue that if someone did that, they were in the right to do that. Yet in saying that, my thoughts were, well, what's to say any of us could get up tomorrow morning and get hit by a bus? Who knows? Not to sound, you know, uh, gloom and doom, but that's life, isn't it? No, there's no guarantees for anyone on anything really. I think the key thing is, is taking it day by day and making sure you make the very most of what we've got. And that's the key. And that outlook in itself can have a big impact. Certainly. Now, imagery. I've worked with people with chronic fatigue, with fibromyalgia, with post-viral syndrome, post-traumatic stress. I've worked with people who've been completely debilitated, who haven't been able to get out of bed, okay, or walk to the kitchen. And in a very short space of time, by doing some key processes, one of which is visualization, there's a powerful impact in the general being. To the point, I've even had top medical consultant write to me and ask me in terms of what I was doing. This was related to one situation. One situation where the girl was under clinical supervision for many years. And within a few weeks, she was back up and running. No, she wasn't running marathons, so to speak, but she had a life much more of a life than she had when she was told by her clinical supervisor that was going to be it. That was it. And you can imagine you've got your whole life ahead of you, you're only very young, and you're told that's it. That's the end of that. And within a few weeks, she got her life back. Studying, went away, going out, socialising, to the point that the consultant written and said, well, what were you doing? I, I wasn't doing anything. I just facilitated and used some of these key processes to take things step by step. <coughs> Other situations, similar to the same, complete debilitation. A few months later, running half marathon, getting back into work, and all sorts of things. And I don't just put it down to this, because it's not just a question of the processes that we use tonight. Yet, in saying that, it can have a massive impact in people's general well-being. Now, visualization, what we said earlier, is what we do automatically anyway. Now, in athletics, in sport, in the field that I do a lot of work in, classic quote by Sally Gunnell, the sprinter, she won gold in Barcelona in 92. She talks about visualizing the race over and over and over again. And you can imagine if you're visualizing that race over and over again in your mind, every fine detail, you're going to give yourself the best chance to win. With my athletes, my sports people, the footballers I work with, at the start of the season, what I do with them is I get them to print the fixture list off, who they're playing, and I tell them, visualize who you're playing against. Process, and we'll talk about outcome process as we go along, which is key and really powerful. And more often than not, the way they plan their game 
and they prepare for every permutation comes into fruition, which is key. So you're giving yourself the best chance to be in a positive situation. So visualization can be used for near enough every, anything. It can be used for interviews. If you're going for an interview, visualize in that interview. The questions being asked at you, answering the questions. Presentation, visualize how you want it to go. Preparation for almost anything. In sports, it can be used to prepare for process, for your role, what to do step by step. And one area is really effective is for people who are ill. They can plan, they can prepare, they can use this process on various levels to start getting their life back, which is key. Now what goes through the mind, we mentioned earlier, if they're diagnosed, they're given little or no help, help, we talked earlier about the despair, the feelings, the force they have. There's a cycle in their mind. Remember we covered earlier the unpleasant experience. Think of that as an experience that we covered earlier. I talked about going back to an unpleasant experience. Think about that. Think about that a hundred times fold with all sorts of various emotions going through your mind. And you can imagine where someone is when in a situation where they've got a whole world ahead of them and they're told they've got a variable condition. Particularly when you think some people have got different levels of resilience. For some people, it can tip them literally over the edge, really. Okay, and it can make them even worse than what they were. Now, what I find is quite ironic, people spend near enough a lifetime studying and learning all these medical advancements, and we've come a long way medically, yet we spend very minimal time actually working with the mind. And how many times have you been to a GP or a doctor, a consultant, with an illness or ailment, you know someone, and they've talked about being positive. They've talked about using a positive approach. You can get better. You can improve. Maybe in the world we live in these days, if we do that, it's seen as setting people up. I don't know. Yet, I'm a big believer in giving people the best chance to succeed, which is key. So the mind is a very powerful tool that we have. Why not use it in the best way? Yet, in saying that, the conventional approach is someone's ill, off you go, go speak to a counselor for, for the next however many months, and go over it. That's great, isn't it? You know, you're walking away fully low as it is, and then you're talking about it over and over again. So you wouldn't put a bad DVD on every night, you wouldn't listen to a song you can't stand every night, you wouldn't go see someone you didn't like every day, yet in saying that, you're quite happy to go and see someone and go over the same old ground, the same old story. And that's not belittling people's conditions and certain situations, because no doubt people experience difficult situations, and I can understand and emphasize. Okay, maybe not on the level that some people I work with, certainly, and maybe some people I've come across, but I can understand what it feels like to be on the receiving end and being told that you're going to have to pretty much settle for that. And the key thing is that some people accept that, and it's a travesty on various levels. In my experience, what people with depression, anxiety, I said earlier, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all sorts of different conditions, all sorts of labels, really. And in my mind, they're just labeled. They're just a label. Because a hundred people with chronic fatigue, with fibromyalgia, with depression, don't all experience the same conditions. They don't. They're all individual. They've all experienced a different set of feelings and thoughts and symptoms and associations. So if we can get to the bottom of where their mind is, what their strategy is for that illness, then we can start moving forward into a more positive area, positive domain. Now, visualization on these levels, helping people who are affected by illness, Getting better, they can visualize themselves getting better. The process of getting better, completing the task, whatever it might be, maybe going to the shop if they've not been out of the house for years, maybe doing a sporting event, maybe doing an activity that we haven't done for a while, respite from pain. People are going through tremendous pain, visualization.
to get some respite from that pain and planning, planning to get better. I did a session with someone who was very seriously ill and I asked her to plan her week. I said, would you be so kind to plan your week? We're at that level now. We've been seeing me now for three or four weeks. Let's set some goals. When I said plan the week, she was very resistant. I thought, is it something I said? And I thought to myself, well, actually, you know what? Maybe I'm jumping gun a bit here. This girl hasn't done any sort of activity for years. And in three or four weeks of working with me, she's getting her life back. And I'm telling her to plan. And I asked, I said, well, when you think about planning, what goes through your mind? I said, can you close your eyes and tell me what you think about? Think, tell me what your future is. I said, where's your future? I can't see one, she says. I don't have a future. I said, if there, were, if there was a, a future or a line that represents time into the future, where would it be? There's nothing, it's all dark. I said, really? It's all dark? If you could see one, hypothetically, what would it be like? <clears throat> Just hypothetically? Well, maybe I can see one off in the distance. I said, well, see one as far as you want to see it. And let's bring it in slowly. And you tell me when to stop. And as a result of doing that process and bringing the future in, she did at least a weekly plan and she lives by a weekly plan week by week to this day yet in my experience no one ever has knocked on my door and delivered a bag of money to me or car or whatever else I went to go out and do it okay so outcome's great fine not a problem with the outcome yet if you're going to wait for that outcome it's going to take a hell of a long time to arrive you've got to take steps forward so process is key so process are the steps you've got to take to achieve what you want I'm all having an outcome, not a problem with that, without I can lose myself. The key thing is to have a process. So the process we use, and I'm giving you a handout, I'm going to demonstrate how we do the technique, and then you can have a bit of a practice yourselves, is to develop a process. And the steps that we take, the first step we, we take is to start with a basic picture of what we want to happen. Okay, so if someone's been debilitated with illness for a while, a basic picture in their mind of what they want to happen. It might be going for a walk to the shop. It might be going shopping. It might be going to see a band. It might be going to tempting bowling, really. But an example of the script was with someone I worked with. Now, they hadn't been out for years. They had not been out for years. Okay, now, they had severe anxiety that was linked to another condition. They had not been out of the house, literally, for years. Would you imagine what that would be like? Not leaving the house for years? Staying indoors? Afraid? Even afraid to put the garbage out? You put the garbage bin out, you actually put it out, you run back in. That fear, that apprehension, that level of anxiety. So, this is the general process we use. A bit more detail than this, but this gives you an idea. This is real. Anxiety. So we did a basic story to begin with, components. Preparation. They wanted to go shopping. Shopping to them was like anyone else going to the moon. It was such a big ordeal. So shopping, okay. Preparation. Think about the shops you're going to go to. The people around you. Driving there in the car. All the detail, right, they have all the detail that goes with going to the shop in their head. Okay. And that was the beginning of what we did. Then the second phase of the exercise was the process. Visualize yourself. Getting in the car. Drive to the shops. When you drive to the shops, notice where you are, what you're going to buy, who you're going to interact with, getting your wallet out, your purse, whatever it is, all the steps it takes. The process that's so going through your mind, going through your mind over and over again until you get it the way you want to get it, which is key. And adding detail. Seeing yourself like you're watching a TV screen, or if you're more comfortable, actually living it in the here and now. There's two types of ways we can visualize, associated and disassociated. This associated is like watching a TV screen. Associated is like the here and now. Some people are more comfortable like a TV screen. Some associate depends on the person. One way to ask someone and to see if someone's either or all is ask them to remember themselves doing an activity. It might be okay. Uh, can you remember getting in the, in the car this morning or yesterday or last week? And if they talk about it in the tense where the actual doing, then it's associated. They talk about seeing themselves. Then it's disassociated. Or maybe you can do a bit of both, depending on the individual. 
And that's the key, adding detail and making sure we work the process. Then, what we do is refine the script. And this is the script, pretty much, the gist of the script that we did. So the key was, feel completely relaxed and confident, make your way to the shop, as you drive in the car, you see the spaces in the car park, you park the car, you can feel the steering wheel in your hands, you go out of the car, you close the door, you hear the car door, every detail of that experience, step by step, okay, until eventually you visualize them going home, sitting down, having a tea, and relaxing, and committing the task. Now, they did this process over and over again, okay, over again, and they completed the task. They did it. Because I said to them, after we did the visualization, you can do it in your mind, you can do it in reality. If you can do it in here, you can do it in reality, because you created it. And I've done this process with many people on very good levels. Working with someone who hadn't been out for a while as well, who had suffered anxiety. They wanted to go to a, a wedding. <coughs> They're very apprehensive about going to this wedding. They hadn't been out of the house for, or hadn't been to a social event for four years, let alone go to a wedding. And I got them to visualize what it would be like at the wedding, step by step. And they went, and they had a good time. And as well as doing this process here, they had an anchor as well to switch back on again every time they felt themselves uh, creeping to that anxiety. And they did it, they completed the task. Another person hadn't been away, same again, hadn't actually been too far away from the vicinity of their own home. They went away on a two week holiday. It was nothing short of a miracle, so I was told. And it was through visualizing and doing it step by step. As I said, it's a process you can use for almost anything. If you've got kids who are doing driving lessons or family and friends, you can get them to do that. If you've got an exam, if you've got a presentation, if you've got an interview, visualize it. Get it in here, which is key. If you get it in there, then it puts you in the driving seat. As I said before, there's no guarantees, but it gives you that best possible chance to get a positive result, which is key. So one who's prepared the best is going to come across more than likely the best possible way. You might fluke it once, you might fluke it twice. You're saying that people who are consistent do this over and over and over again. They are hard wired to succeed, which is key. They literally hard wire themselves to succeed. And that's the key, really, giving yourself the best chance. Let's give it a go. Is it in the context of you got an, an essay or? Yeah, I've got an essay to write. And how do you feel about the essay? Um, avoiding it. You're avoiding the essay? How can you avoid the essay? It's just something I do. You avoid, okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's good. That's good to know, isn't it? Hey? To the last minute. Does that work for you? I don't want to spoil it. I hope something's not broken. You don't want to fix it. Well, it works, but it's not particularly pleasant. Okay. And you'd like to be able to. to Yeah. Okay, okay. So, yeah, okay, so. Yeah, yeah if you could do you're okay to, to come up with it. You know? So, the first thing is what we do is we add some detail. So, the situation involves writing an essay. Okay, what type of essay is it? An academic essay. How many words? Um, two and a half thousand. Two and a half thousand. Where are you when you're writing the essay? Uh, at home, at the kitchen table. Okay. Is it cold? Is it warm? Uh, it's warm with a few drafts. Okay, warm for me now. A few drafts. Okay, what else is there? Have you got? Um, I might have my dog around me nagging me. Okay. Okay, okay so your dog, anybody else in the room? Any, any noises, anything? Uh, I might have my music on. Okay, music. <coughs> Listen to anything specific? Um, something that isn't going to distract me too much. Okay. Is it low? Is it high? 
Have you got one one coming up soon? An essay that you've got to write soon? Yeah. Okay, and when's it due? It's Friday. It's Friday? You better get to work. <laughs> you better go home now and get writing. <laughs> what are you doing here when you an essay? <laughs> then again in saying that this could be this could be the one, this could be the moment. The ring up is for a reason, by the way. Okay, so you've got this essay due on Friday. Do you not think it's an idea to start? It might be. <laughs> when were you intending on starting? Uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, two weeks ago. <laughs> when are you intending on starting now? Uh, tomorrow. You're going to give it a start tomorrow, yeah. okay. And how do you want this essay to go? Um, okay. Well, the essay, what would you want the outcome to be? Um, I'd like to be able to read it and think that's quite interesting. Okay. You'd like to read it and think that's quite interesting? Yes. And that's how you quantify the outcome you're looking for? Uh, yeah, and I suppose obviously it's got to meet the targets. Yeah. It's got to uh, match what the title wants to be to. Okay, so it's got to meet the targets, okay. And do you feel confident you can meet the targets? Uh, I think so, if, I'm, if I get it done. You think so? Is that convincing? Yes, I can. <laughs> of course you can do it. Have you done that before? Yeah. You can do it again. And that's the key. And the key is, we, we, we sort of, what we do is we, we develop a scenario here for the process. Okay, we do a scenario, we write a bit of the script, and then once we've written the script, we can refine the script. So I'm not going to go into every detail now, because the process could last an hour or even beyond an hour. It could take me just an hour or more than an hour to refine the script. But this gives you a feel for the process. Okay, recreate the scenario as close as we possibly can. And after we've created a scenario as close as we possibly can, we can then fine tune the more minor details. Okay, we can tap into the more minor details. And then after we've done all that, we can then start writing a script. And we can agree the script with the client. One that works for them. It's no good script coming from us. It's a two-way process, which is key. A two-way process we want to negotiate to receive positive result, okay, which is key. Now, one way we can do the process, and to let you tell a little bit of a secret, which is quite powerful, I'll talk about the outcome, not being as significant as the process. Yet, in saying that, the outcome can be compelling and drive us to kickstart that process if the outcome is compelling enough. Okay, so let's start with the outcome, and we start with the outcome. Now you talked about this being interesting to you, meeting a few targets. If this essay was just about being interesting to you and meeting a few targets, I'm sure you could generate, I'm sure you'd get equally as much interest watching your program on TV or going for a walk, going to the pub, or you could, there's other things you can with your time. What's this essay all about? Uh, a new career. A new career. There we go. So does that drive you a bit more? Definitely, it would drive me. If I was doing an essay just for, to meet a few targets and interesting, then I'd probably watch the football on TV. That's just the way I am. I'd find that more interesting. Or I'd probably watch, I don't know, who knows. I'd find something to do. But if I thought this is about my career, if the football goes off, my career is more important. Okay, and that's key, a generating outcome, a powerful outcome. So this essay is about the career, the direction when you're going in your career. You've been successful in submitting essays before, you mentioned that. Okay, you have a process that you work with. Are you happy with that process when you actually get on and, and, and do the essay? Does it work for you? Um, it works, but it's stressful. It works, but it's stressful. Okay. What would make it less stressful? Um, to have more time. To have more time. Um, and who's in control of your time? Okay, so if you're controlling your time, the next time you have a deadline, do you think it might be an idea to give yourself more time? Because you might write it, and having wrote it yet, so you might come back to it again, and refine it, get it to a level that you'd like to get the essay. Yet, in saying that, let's work towards Friday. So you said, was it tomorrow you're going to make a start? Okay, let's visualise yourself. 
okay? And I'm going to create a script, okay? And as I said earlier, the time that we've got could go on for near enough an hour. Yet in saying that, we'll just condense it to a couple of minutes. Just give you a feel for what it's like to visualize. So if you don't mind, just close your eyes and really relax. And I want you to visualize yourself. First of all, visualize the outcome. Visualize the career change. Visualize yourself doing what you want to do, what you see, what you hear, what you feel, doing the new career in the here and now, what it's like doing the new career. And notice how compelling it is to be doing that career and what it feels like to be living that career. And now I just want you to work backwards and think of the process to get to that outcome. And as you realize the process to get to that outcome, I want you to visualize yourself tomorrow evening going through the process that's going to help you work toward achieve that outcome of that new career. So you may get ready and get prepared and get all your material out. And you're going to states Go into that state that you're in when you're totally focused on your essay. Notice what you see, what you hear, what you feel. Get in that zone. That zone when everything flows. And time just drifts along. So you're in that zone and go back to a time. And give me a nod when you're back in a time when you're in that zone. And stay in that zone. And in that zone, I want you to imagine where you are, the surroundings, you're at home, in the kitchen, it's warm, there's a little bit of a draft. You're thinking about the <coughs> targets that you want to meet for the essay, the criteria, yet you're compelled by the goal of the career change. The dog is in the background and the music is at a level that you're comfortable enough not to be distracted. And you're focusing and you're flowing. And you start the essay. You might prepare with a pen and paper, you might use the laptop, a computer, and all the resources you've got around you, and you start the essay and you flow. And you write and you write and you write. And as you write in that zone of optimal performance, you feel comfortable and you feel relaxed that you've got plenty of time to meet the criteria you're looking for. And the criteria you're looking for is working towards the outcome you want. And you're breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, feeling relaxed. And just see yourself like you can see a TV screen, writing away until you enter the screen and live it in the here and now. And that's what it feels like. You work towards completing the essay. And as you, as you complete the essay, you might have a break. You might go for a walk, you might make a cup of tea or a drink. And you go back to reading. And as you go back to reading the essay, you see how you've met that criteria. And if you see anything on the essay that you want to brush up, you can go back to and you can do that as well. But you're in total control and you've got plenty of time between now and Friday to work towards where you want it to be. As a result of doing the process, you start realizing that in future essays, it's always good to start as you mean to go on and take control of the situation and go through that process again where you set up the room and the resources and you go into that state of optimal performance and let things flow. And then it gradually brings you back to the here and now. Okay, what does it feel like? Um, I got quite quickly into the zone. Yeah. What, it, what it's like. Yeah. I think what you said flow. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Like and as a result of going there, you felt? Uh, yeah, I felt relieved at yeah. the time afterwards. Yeah. Brilliant, that's great. Thanks for having me go. I really appreciate that. And thank you. Yeah, definitely. Big clap. Sure. And, and as I was 
mentioned earlier, it's a process that we could have gone on for a lot longer, but we haven't got all the evening. The key is really, is to give you the outline of giving you some worksheets that you can reflect on. And the key is really, is refining your script. That's what's really important, making the script appropriate to the situation and making it as real as possible, which is key. So when you're doing the experience, you give yourself the best possible chance to succeed. And that's as much as you can ask anyone to do. Okay, I was working with a team recently and we were involved in the penalty shootout and we outplayed this team significantly. We were winning, they were, they were at a higher level than us. We were winning 2-1 until the last minute of the game and they scored a goal. And literally, the manager, one of the coaching staff, and all the players, heads went down. And they were talking about how we've thrown the game away, how they were really down about throwing it away. I said, look guys, we've got a penalty shootout. No one's going anywhere just yet. Just take a moment and relax and calm down. We'll, we'll address what's happened because we had needed addressing. It was poor defending that needed addressing. It was a mistake. Yet, for now, there's nothing we can do about it. Just focus, we haven't gone out of this shootout just yet. Get your head together, get your force together, and focus, and get a feel but hit the back of the net, and just take a moment to close your eyes and visualize yourself striking the ball and hitting the back of the net. We won the shootout. Every one of our takers scored. A young girl I was working with a couple of years ago, who was a trampolinist, and she wanted to give up doing trampolining because one of her friends suffered a horrific injury. She had enough. Her mum asked me if I could help her out. I said, well, we can give it a go. And we used this visualization process. I said, okay, put everything else to one side and visualize yourself doing the routines. Just visualize yourself doing the routines. Nothing more, nothing less. Because she decided she wanted to compete in this championship. Just visualize yourself doing the routines. Go on the brink of giving up because of this situation that happened to her friend, an injury, turns things around. I get a text on the day of the championships saying she'd won silver. She narrowly missed out on goal by 0.1. And her mom says, she was pleased, but her daughter wasn't pleased. Yet, in saying that, I was happy she wasn't pleased because we want to strive for the top. Yet, in saying that, four months earlier, she was ready to give everything away and couldn't even get a ranking, let alone win anything. And it shows the power of visualization, which is key. Another situation, a guy phones me up, or well, his wife phones me up and talks about how he's got a military uh, exercise to do. He's got four days to complete a series of exercises, one of which is a two mile run. Whenever he even thinks about the two mile run, he goes to pieces because the outcome of the promotion was getting to him. He doesn't believe in psychology, he doesn't really believe in NLP yet, he's willing to give it a go at me because time is of the essence. We've got four days. If I try and do things, he's logically, he'll probably, not, he'll probably tear a hamstring or muscle and he's out completely. So we use this process to visualize himself getting the time he wants to get after two mile. Now I know this guy can run because after 1.5 mile he's okay, but he goes to pieces in the last 500 because he focuses too much on the outcome. Go back to process. Sends me a text. On the Monday, the day of the run, he says, got bad news for us. Oh no, here we go. He says, it was cancelled for one reason or the other. Okay, I said, okay, well, stay calm. You go again tomorrow, visualize yourself doing what you do. I get a text on the Tuesday, great news, I smashed it by 41 seconds. And the interesting thing was, the time you got for two miles was within half a second of what we visualized over and over and over again. And that's how powerful the mind can be when you focus like a laser beam, which is key. And I can think of a number of people that we sort of touched on using this process for people with illnesses and ailments to help them start taking steps towards overcoming debilitation. Yet yeah, this can be used across a broad range of areas.